Welcome to episode number 348 of the Beyond Social Media Show, the podcast for all of you marketing, advertising, public relations, and communications professionals. We are recording on May 1st, 2021. You can find us by searching for Beyond Social Media Show. Next week, you'll want to tune in for my interview with Blois Olson of Fluence Media, who publishes a ton of email newsletters. We are going to be talking uh, email marketing, newsletter marketing, and, uh, and Minnesota politics. Uh, so tune in for that. But this week, we have a ton of things to talk about that are in the news of marketing. Among them, cheap TikToker, disaster girl cashes in, monetizing Clubhouse, Clubhouse partnerships, paid podcasts, classic po product placements, vaccination PSTs or public service tweets, sponsored newsletters, clever recruiting marketing, clever social marketing, Facebook fails, Slander Incorporated, Basecamp ban, Apple's power move, and you want to stick around for some stats about pandemic pounds, but we kick it off with the best story of the week, and BL always has that honors, BL. What was the best story of, well, the past two weeks? Yeah, well, I, I think that this is what everybody on social media, you know, dreams could possibly happen to them. Uh, TikTok has um, made... A, a young fan, um, a the chief TikTok officer. Um, her her name is Sophie Jameson, and her TikTok handle is Nerfers101. And uh, actually, Nerf hired her, excuse me, to be the chief TikTok officer for their brand. And she has more than 1.8 million followers, and she beat out a thousand other applicants. It's a ten thousand dollar a month position as chief. TikTok officer at Nerf, and she has a three-month tenure that started uh, this week. And uh, this is from an ad week story by David Cohn. So uh, Sophie lives in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. She's a college student. She's a junior at the University of Southern Maine, and she's getting a bachelor's degree in business management. And her Nerfers 101 account has more than 1.8 million followers since she debuted it last year. Um, and so uh, she she has editing skills and she loves the brand. And when they saw, you know, the type of posts that she was doing, they reached out to her. So she's also developing her own consulting company and she gives motivational talks at schools around New England on the importance of authenticity and passion in pursuing life endeavors and achieving goals. I mean, we should start her presidential campaign, you know, uh, right now but uh, so the campaign looking for the the nerf tiktok officer ran from uh, march 26th to april 4th and they were looking for a quote trend obsessed highly creative nerf fan to do this three-month stint and at ten thousand dollars a month including perks like nerf blasters and other swag so the nerf the at nerf tiktok account uh, went from roughly 22,000 followers at the start of the campaign to over 100,000 at the moment, um, at picking up 42,000 of them uh, during the campaign. And the channel uh, totaled 250,000 likes during the same time period. So in addition, the Nerf application hashtag has been viewed approximately 84 million times. So a $10,000 a month job is in social media is a lot of people's dreams. So more than 1,000 applications were narrowed down to fewer than 10. And then they went through a half hour interview with a panel from Hasbro's global marketing, uh, public relations and social communications teams. And they uh, were looking for what the people loved about TikTok and how they'd apply their knowledge and a love of Nerf to the position. And she won. Good for her. <laughs> $10,000 a month. Uh huh. For how old is she? Uh, well, she's a junior in college. How old oh does that make God. you? God, are you a, are you a Nerf fan, BL? A uh, Nerf fan? I can't say I am. No. Well, I can say that I am. I'm a total <laughs> Nerf fan. One one Nerf football right here. <laughs> Second Nerf football right here. Um, I have. I grew up with Nerfs. So it was Nerf. Oh, aren't Nerfs squishy? Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. I used to have Nerf, but I don't have them anymore. So I grew up with, of course I have them. I grew up with <laughs> Nerf, Nerf footballs. There was a competitor for a while called It's a Ball, and it was a uh, squishy, and I loved it, but it, it, it just couldn't compete with Nerf because, you know who invented Nerf, the Nerf football? I do not. Fred Cox. Fred Cox invented the Nerf football, longtime Minnesota Vikings kicker. He was a chiropractor. He made a hell of a lot more money from his chiropractic job. It's back in the day when NFL football players had two jobs, a job during the summer and, and then the football uh, gig. Um, but then he invented the Nerf football, sold it to um, Parker Brothers, I think was the name of the company at the time. And uh, yeah, made a lot of money off of it. But, but didn't Nerf also have these things you could hit people with? Yeah, like, but the first, yeah, no. the, the original, the original product was the Nerf football. Oh, okay. Because I had the Nerf, like it was like a noodle. Yeah. And, right. Yeah. Yep. And and yep. you could play with those. Yeah, those yep. were fun. But yep. I didn't know there was even a football. But then again, I don't play football. <laughs> so um, what have you got, Dave? Uh, Disaster Girl is in the news. Do you? Don't you uh, love her? Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I a lot of stuff I didn't know about. Uh, this is from a New York Times article by uh, Marie Fazio. Um, so everybody's familiar with Disaster Girl, the meme that doesn't die. Um, in Apparently on a Saturday morning in 2005, Zoe Roth was four years old and her family went to see a house burning. It uh, doesn't sound as odd as you might imagine. It was a controlled fire set by the fire department in their neighborhood in Mebane or Mebane, North Carolina. Uh, so they set a fire ablaze to this house as you know a training exercise, and neighbors gathered around to watch the house burn because why not? Uh, and the uh, the firefighters uh, allowed kids to hold the hold the hoses and everything. Um, but her father, Zoe's father. Uh, was an amateur photographer and uh, and took that picture. Asked her to smile. She flashed that devilish smirk, and with the fire raging behind her, and uh, Disaster Girl was born. So her father entered the photograph in a photo contest in 2007 and won. And um, now Zoe Roth, an adult, has sold the original copy of her meme as a non fungible token, of course. Uh, for nearly half a million dollars. Um, so good for her um, because, you know, she had no control over her becoming a meme. Uh, she's gotten gotten something out of it. She's apparently going to use it to pay off student loans and uh, donate some to charity. There are, the article also later, later in, the, in the article cites a guy named Ben Lashes who is, who manages the Roths and other stars of memes. Who knew that there was a meme <laughs> Talented agent. Yeah, talented. Really. So he manages a uh, neon cat and grumpy cat and keyboard cat and doge and success kid. And uh, David after dentist and ridiculously photographic guy, photogenic guy. Uh, and he said his clients had cumulatively made over 2 million in N NFT sales. So it, it's just stunning to me that this is even a thing. Oh, it's a thing, David, and it's going yeah. to be a bigger thing. It's, it's, you know, it's really the, uh, the way that Jeremiah Oyang explained this to me, he said, back when we started blogging, these were our personal media mediums. And now we have personal currency. And, and when you have personal currency, you can trade it, you can make money on it, you right. can do all kinds of things right. with it. It is a new and and uh, was it MasterCard or Visa this week that is taking um, uh, crypto uh, as is having that as part of of the uh, way you can buy things. But but anyway, talking about monetizing, um, Clubhouse is in the process of monetizing the platform, and uh, you know uh, there's a company called Club Market. That's a newly launched third party app that's not uh, related to uh, Clubhouse. And uh, they facilitate a deal making between brands and influencers on Clubhouse by allowing Clubhouse hosts to monetize their content via partnerships with brands. So this is from a Digiday story by Kamiko McCoy. And um, since launching last month, Club Market selected 25 Clubhouse clubs to add to its network. And the clubs are ticked typically led by one or two creators who work. And, and so now they're going to work with brands. In this case, um, the clubs range from 
less than 2,000 followers to just under half a million. And Club Market's network includes creators like Christina Holder, who manages the, however you pronounce this, Womixen and Business Club, well, Women in Business Club, with 310,000 followers. Uh, she has others. And so those 25 were selected from more than 500 inquiries from creators who want sponsorship and more than 100 from brands who are interested in sponsoring creators to promote their product. Um, so it's unclear why brands have committed to sponsorship at, and Club Market um, define, uh, declined to provide the details, but Club Market uh, plans to build a digital marketplace to roll out in the coming week with profiles, payment, booking, and everything you could expect in a marketplace. Same thing that is on TikTok, that is on uh, well, it's on TikTok. I don't know where else it is, but it'll take a 20% commission on transactions. So earlier this month, uh, earlier in April, rather, Clubhouse launched a feature that allows users to send money to tip creators um, on the app. And they say 100% of the payment goes towards the creator. And on the Clubhouse blog, the user sending the money will be charged, it said it, they'll be charged a small processing fee, which basically goes to the processing partner, not to Clubhouse and their processing partner is Stripe. So um, Clubhouse says this is the first of many features to come. And since the capability went live, Walter Gear, who's the executive director of experience design at WMLYNR, which is a marketing agency, um, has made $1.35. Um, he is a clubhouse influencer with more than 18,000 followers, but he's skeptical of the rush to monetize, saying it's too early for third-party offerings and, and clubhouse monetization. He says the push we're hearing is not coming from them, but coming from the users of the app. It's coming from the people who want to be famous and who want to use this app as a platform to get rich and be found. So we'll find out who's right sooner or later. But, um, you know, monetization is a big thing. And, and there are so many posers on Clubhouse. It's not even funny. And there, there also are some really respectable people. I found myself in a conversation about a week ago. Um, somebody invited me into it. They, they pinged me and said, you, you really should be here. The chief marketing, uh, the chief scientist of NASA and several astronauts and astrophysicists were having a conversation about what it's like to go to space. And uh, the conversation included UFOs and all kinds of things. And it was fascinating, you know, so there are some pretty astounding things going on there. And there are also, you know, all these coaches and multi-level marketers yeah, yeah, and, yeah. you know, crap people like that. So I uh, recently started spending more time in club, Clubhouse and um, went from, <laughs> From all I was getting was uh, was notifications about things I wasn't interested in to changing actually actually adding my bio and filling out my bio and fo following finding clubs and following people that uh, that are that I'm interested in the polit politics and and marketing and sports and stuff and now my feed actually has a bunch of relevant stuff in it so I'm listening to some really good conversations yes there are the get rich quick people and there's the uh, you know blah, blah, crap. Blah. but uh but there's some really good stuff going on there um so I, I I don't know if I missed this or not but this uh this kind of uh, influencer matching service that's a third party company that's doing that is that right yes, it's not, not yes. TikTok yeah right yeah, I, I think yeah, not it's, clubhouse. It, it, clubhouse, I meant. Yeah, yeah. that's uh, yeah, too early. Um, but <laughs> Clubhouse is is monetizing um, through brand partnerships. So this is from the Verge's Kim Lyons, uh, who reports that. So NFL draft weekend is the NFL draft is going on right now. Bl, I'm missing this the NFL draft because of the podcast. That's how devoted I am to be on <laughs> social media show. Um, but it is the end of the draft. So last day is today. Uh, the draft started Friday. Big thing, of course, for for uh, football fans. Um, but Clubhouse had uh, did a partnership with the NFL for exclusive programming during the draft. Um, the NFL hosted a series of draft themed rooms on Clubhouse throughout the week, from Friday till actually from Monday till today. Uh, with uh, they had player assessments, mock drafts for fans, and other stuff. Uh, fans, of course, it's Clubhouse, so fans can drop into the rooms, follow picks there as they're announced, uh, listen to discussion 
discussion discussions from uh, NFL uh, figures, athletes, uh, analysts, coaches, etc. And they can also fans can be invited on stage by moderators to ask draft questions and share their reactions. I don't know how I haven't listened to them. I don't know how good that will be because you know I don't know how sophisticated a lot of fans are. But you know, <laughs> well, I guess I could have found out. I didn't listen. Um, but Clubhouse, this is their first. They had a huge first year. They had more than 10 million downloads. We've talked about the competing audio podcast, audio formats that are coming out from Twitter, LinkedIn, Discord, Spotify, Slack, Facebook. I actually just got um, uh, Twitter spaces. I just noticed that yesterday. So I actually have access to that. So we'll try this out. But uh, yeah, audio, uh, uh, online audio is is blowing up. and uh, And this is just another example of it. There are more than 37 examples and counting right now of, of audio platforms. Reddit's got one. Everybody's got one. So um, Spotify had a big announcement this week, and uh, they're launching paid subscriptions to podcasts. Um, and they say podcasters will keep 100% of the money until 2023. Um, so this is from Spotify, and uh, they said that um, with paid subscriptions, uh, Spotify's open access uh, platform and independent creators are going to come into the Spotify audience network and which will work through Anchor that they bought. Was it last year, I think, or was it earlier this year? I have no concept of time anymore. But um, by enabling wide distribution of subscriber only content, they say in their posts, our aim is to help podcasters maximize their subscription audiences and grow them from their existing listener bases. With Spot within Spotify, this content is searchable and discoverable like any other podcast episode. But if I understand this correctly, <clears throat> you also can find these paid podcasts on other platforms. So the first group includes 12 independent podcasts podcasters who are positioned, according to Spotify, to uh, succeed in gaining meaningful revenue from their audiences. And they are going to publish subscriber-only bonus content, kind of like Substack, um, in their existing podcast feeds. And starting now, they're also going to uh, have uh, submissions from their for a wait list, effectively expanding the program. Um, and they want to expand it over the world. So they're also uh, collaborating with NPR and they're publishing a selection of NPR shows sponsor free for paid subscribers. I frankly don't mind their sponsors. I always find them interesting, but um, five shows will be available starting uh, May 4th. How I Built This with Guy Raz, which is so great. Uh, Shortwave, uh, It's Been a Minute uh, with Sam Sanders at Code Switch and Planet Money. And more to come in the next few weeks. And um, NPR shows are marked as plus. And for example, Planet Money Plus. And so to subscribe, you do that from within Spotify. It's interesting, but um, you only get to keep all the money till 2023. I don't know what happens after that. What, do they take it back? I don't know. They haven't said. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, something to check out. Yeah. Um, so um, this this is absolutely fascinating and and entirely predictable. This is from a BBC story uh, by Jonty Bloom, who reports that. Uh, so, uh, did you do you like Buster Keaton? BL? I do. Yeah, I do. So do I. So do I. So apparently, I didn't know this, but apparently, uh, Buster Keaton's uh, movie, The Garage, silent movie, The Garage, and from 1919, was the first example of product placement uh, with a featured a logo of a petrol firm and motor oil company petrol this is a british article obviously uh in a motor oil company um i found the uh found the uh the, the garage on youtube and found the section where they actually had product placements so we'll put that in the show notes um, but fast forward a century and total total global product placement industry uh is said to be worth 20.6 billion according to uh PQ Media data analyst firm. And the advertising industry is now using technology to insert CGI products into movies and TV shows. So think new product labels on uh, champagne bottles in Rick's Cafe in Casablanca. Um, 
the UK in the advertising industry business, uh, Myriad, there's a company called Myriad who is using uh, technology, is, is using their technology for a uh, Chinese video streaming website. And the article has, we'll include these, the article has before and after screenshots of a Chinese TV show of a scene where there's before uh, from the scene from the show. And then after there's a, in the background, a billboard that has Coke, a Coke uh, billboard advertisement on it that wasn't in the original. So it's been digitally inserted into the scene and it looks entirely real. Uh, there's a guy in the article uh, quoted named James, James Sandum, who is the managing director of uh, Red Light Management, who believes that musicians will leap at the chance to add digital product placement to their music videos, both old and new. I mean, think about it on YouTube. Music videos just keep accruing views and keep accruing views. Um, so, you know, you can, if you can swap out uh, product placement and earn some, earn some money from from uh, advertisers uh, for that product placement, you're going to have a recurring, you know, recurring revenue stream. Uh, so the quote from this guy is: "The opportunity to carve out a new revenue stream is rare, and the ability to re retrospectively use existing content and build new con content with it is mind uh, with it in mind is exciting." Then uh, Myriad's chief executive uh, Stefan Ber Berenger. Um, says that next leap forward would be to add digitally add product banners to live sports or concert broadcasts in real time. And then there's a guy named Rod, Roy Taylor, who's uh, quoted, he's a chief executive of a company called Riff. Uh, and his firm has developed technology where the product placement is targeted at individuals and that changes depending on who is watching. So think about you're watching a TV, your favorite TV show, BL, and there is a product that you had in your Amazon cart, but you hadn't purchased yet, but is included in the show because the show knows that you haven't purchased that. You need to complete that purchase from your Amazon. <laughs> so uh, I don't know how I feel about this, especially with you know classic films. If you're adding, there, they had one example of a, uh, you know, a client, a, a character in the show could be drinking wine in the original, but from the data, we know that the person isn't a drinker. They don't drink at all. So they change the wine to water or something else that's not alcoholic. And that that changes the nature of the character of the show. So I don't know how I feel about the, the artistic integrity of that, but interesting development. Well, I mean, it's also one of those things that you I mean this didn't exist before, yeah. you know. I mean, it just seems like something that that would have always been there, and uh, always at least in the last twenty five years when that capability has been possible. But you know, yeah, it's a little bit um, to take a classic film and and insert products in it is sort of offensive. But uh, you know, money wherever money is, what are you going to do? Right. <laughs> I mean, so um, Twitter is now uh, trying to help promote vaccines. And um, this is from uh, their uh, social media today and also from Twitter support. And uh, on social media today, it was Andrew Hutchinson. And they announced a new push to help maximize uh, vaccine um, take up. And, and, uh, and there's, they're having in-feed notifications that go to users. Um, they started this week. I, I actually have seen them, but I didn't capture it. And um, they also have begun to put uh, to try and combat disinformation. So um, there will be prompts in, in things that are fake to say that this is not real. But um, the things that you'll see uh, in your timeline links to sources about vaccine safety, efficacy, and news from public health experts, you know, from credible sources, and mislabeled, uh, misleading tweets are going to be labeled, which is just great. So the prompts link you to um, Twitter's COVID-19 Information Center, which I didn't know they had, uh, in order to help users get a better understanding of where they can get a vaccine, and then information on uh, how the vaccine is made, uh, WHO advice, health updates. Um, and so a lot of social networks are working to maximize vaccine take up and including promoted uh, tweets, it, it links in their official content. Um, so this is a good thing and a necessary thing. Yeah, I hope they're using what they know about, uh, you know, about the content of individual 
Twitter users' tweets that they can promote this stuff to people who are showing hesitancy or, or you know, skepticism in their own content. So, you know, I don't know if of- they will do that, but um, there is so much misinformation yeah. that, you know, is being spread. So there has to be. But, you know, one thing that is being done that's so wrong about vaccine promotion is every time they talk about it, they are jabbing needle, big needles into people's arms. I can't even look at it. You know, I mean, 25% of all people are terrified of needles. Why aren't you showing them putting a Band-Aid on the arm? Why aren't you showing them smiling? You Good know, point. but I mean, needles, These and some of the needles have like something on them. Yeah, I don't know stop what they talking are. about needles. I'm not a big fan <laughs> of needles either. I'm on yeah. and on about needles. <laughs> all right. So um, BL email, email marketing is the new black or it's always been the new black, I think. Um, but this is another indication of that. This is from uh, Digiday Sarah Guglioni, I think is how you pronounce it. Probably, I probably, probably not. That. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Flipboard, the, uh, the uh, um, news, social news app um, that I love, is uh, moving their newsletter portfolio away from being supported by pro- programmatic display ads to selling uh, native newsletter sponsorships instead. Um, so by the end of the first quarter of this year, the company had moved nearly all of its emails to, uh, to native formats, sponsorship formats. Um, those are where an advertiser pays to sponsor an email for a single day, and then they get a piece of branded content in the body of the email. So it might have, you know, sponsored by, um, Tide or whatever, and then Tide would have an article that, that looks like the rest of the newsletter. Um, as opposed to just having a banner ad, banner ads in the in, in your newsletter. So they are on track. Flipboard is on track to do away with banner ads completely by the end of the second quarter. Their open rates range from 20 to 40 percent. And uh, on average, they are seeing two to 10 times higher click through rate with a new native formats compared to banner ads. That doesn't surprise me at all. But it is, you know, content, content, content. Rather, people have banner blindness. I've been saying it for, I mean, you know, forever De- decades or whatever but yeah. Uh, yeah so if something looks like an ad people aren't going to pay attention to it you need to call it out as a sponsorship so people know that it's it's paid for but um this is a smart move well one of the interviews that i have scheduled is with bob hoffman who believes that programmatic is evil and who has written several books about it and who also believes that facebook is evil and we are going to talk about both of those things oh good do you yeah. have any more good ones i do not do you I do. I have two quick ones. This uh, this uh, first one is um, from Punch Pizza, my favorite pizza place in uh, in Minnesota. Here, um, they are a former clients. Uh, they do genuine Neapolitan pizza. They have these huge ovens that uh, they uh, wood fired ovens that they cook the pizzas in uh, for 90, 90 seconds and comes out and it's just the most delicious thing ever. So um, they sent an I, I subscribed to their news either email and they sent an email um about their uh, <laughs> increasing of their wages so i'm just gonna wait they they're starting hourly wage is now going to be 15 dollars an hour the, the, i'm going to quote some of the newsletter the email here we think of our employees as our number one asset, when we ask customers why they return to punch, the top two answers closely ranked are the quality of our pizza and our engaged, friendly employees. And they are very engaged and friendly. Um, our employees braved the risk of returning to work during the pandemic and have done an amazing job. In addition to raising our starting wage to $15 an hour, every single current punch employee is also receiving a raise as a thank you for their hard work and dedication, especially during this tough year. The investment in our people is both record, both to recognize their efforts, but also uh, to enable Punch to recruit, hire, and retain the best employees for the future. They really believe that the, 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 their payment, uh, their salaries, their, their, their hourly wages are a competitive uh, uh, advantage. Uh, one of Punch's key business strategies through its 25 years of operation has been, here we go, to pay our employees more than our competitors is a critical part of our mission to delight every customer. Uh, and then they, the next, paragraph is, if you're interested in joining our team, 
or know someone who might be, please visit our website at punchpizza.com slash jobs and check out of the current openings. They have an infographic and below the infographic is a, is a photo of the 2014 State of the Union address in which the owner, John Serrano, was invited by President Obama as one of the spotlighted honored people uh, because of their commitment to higher wages. So they raised wages before it was cool to do so um, and, and got, got recognized for it because, they, because it's a business imperative. Now that's really, really good news. You know, Costco has done this for a long time and it is a competitive advantage. They I believe their starting pay is $18 an hour. Wow. And, you know, and, and the people who work there do not look miserable. And, you know, I mean, that makes a big difference. Yeah, it usually yeah. does. But I had my first piece of pizza in a year <laughs> the other day and because i hadn't gone to any uh any outdoor restaurants and uh finally i met my friend for lunch he said what do you want I said, pizza oh, <laughs> it was oh, so that's, good. That's good that's good um i got one thin more crust is yours thin crust i well uh punch pizza is is um i don't know that you'd call it thin it's neapolitan pizza is soggy in the middle um, uh -huh. So that's just how how it works. People who don't know about Neapolitan pizza don't understand. They complain about it, but it's good. It's fantastic. <laughs> Whenever you come to come to uh, Minnesota, BL, we'll go to Punch Pizza. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, I've got a um, one one more good one. We'll get on the bad. This is real quick. I came across this uh, graphic on 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 Facebook. Um, shared by somebody who's obviously a union supporter. And the graphic is just a square black background. And in the middle, there's a, there's a line that says in white lettering, this person loves unions. And the arrow, there's an arrow from that pointing up to where the icon of the person sharing the content would be. In the in the post, right? So there's the icon with your name next to it. You share a post, an image, and it's pointing up to that to where you are. Uh, so this person loves unions. It's pointing up to the person. Then it says union proud, union strong, and then at the bottom below that it says so do these people in white lettering, and has an arrow pointing down to where all the comments, the reactions, the likes, the hearts, and everything are. So it's really using the dynamic and the format of social media to encourage people to engage in the uh engage in the uh, in the post by liking it because you know if you like uh unions then you gotta gotta vote for it by liking the post and everything so i thought it was really clever we'll put a put a embedded in the show notes so people can see it rather than hearing me explain it yeah yeah looking at it is a lot simpler <laughs> 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 so um, if that brings us to bad news, it Facebook's does. at the top of my list. Uh, this is from a, uh, a, a BuzzFeed story. Uh, after BuzzFeed News reported uh, that there was an internal document at Facebook that examined their failings leading up to the Capitol riot, uh, many of Facebook employees were prevented from accessing it. So BuzzFeed published the report so everybody can read it. Um, so uh, this title, the report was titled Stop the Steal and Patriot Party, the Growth and Mitigation of an Adversarial Harmful Movement. And it's one of the most important analyses of the insurrection uh, effort to overturn the election. And um, so uh, Facebook, and it's all about how Facebook recognizes that they missed all these critical warnings, because apparently a lot of people there are brain dead. Um, the report examines how the company was caught flat footed at the Stop the Steal Facebook group supercharged this movement. Uh, to undermine democracy. It concludes that the company was unprepared to stop people from spreading hate and incitement to violence on its platform, despite Zuckerberg's multiple apologies for not doing that. Uh, among its most significant findings is that Facebook failed to realize until after the, the January 6th insurrection that uh, many of the Stop the Steal groups and pages were actually part of a cohesive movement. And this resulted in them banning individual pages um, and groups, but allowing others to stay up. So uh, notably, they banned all mentions of Stop the Steal several days 
after the inter insurrection um, and a wave of storm the capital events across the country uh, were still up. And then they realized that the individual uh, groups and pages and slogans did constitute a cohesive movement. So uh, the weird cover image of the report uh, is a burning US Capitol building and for some reason, a cartoon corgi dressed as a firefighter. I cannot find that image anywhere, but I, I can picture it without any problem. And, you know, it's just yet another Facebook failure. I believe Facebook should die. I believe Facebook has long outlived its usefulness. I'm surprised they didn't use Disaster Girl for that. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> it would um, be perfect. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, not as bad as uh, aiding and abetting insurrection, but this is pretty bad. Uh, the New York Times is Aaron Krolik and uh, Kashmir Hill have an article titled The Slander Industry. And it's too long, must read. I'll just tease you with the beginning portions of it. Uh, it reads, my colleague Kashmir Hill and I were trying to learn who is responsible for and profiting from the growing ecosystem of websites whose primary purpose is destroying reputations. So I wrote a nasty post about myself. Then we watched as a constellation of sites duplicated my creation. To get the slander removed, many people hire a reputation management company. In my case, it was going to cost me roughly $20,000. We soon discovered a secret hidden behind a smokescreen of fake companies and false identities. The people facilitating slander and the self-proclaimed good guys who help remove it are often one and the same. Jeez. Yeah, I ran into this uh, years ago with a website called uh, ripoffreport.com uh, that I had a client get somebody wrote a, or they wrote a nasty thing about her and it was showing up in search. So I helped her deal with that. But yeah, there's no accountability for these things. It's and they're and they're charging. Well, we'll take it off, but we're going to cost, it's going to cost you a lot of money to take it off. Well, I'm glad that article Damn. ran. Maybe that will help. But, you know, yeah, that's really horrible. So uh, also horrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Basecamp CEO Jason Fried uh, followed in the footsteps of uh, Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong, who we talked about last year, uh, by banning politics in the workplace. So this is from a TechCrunch story by Taylor Hatmaker, I love her name. And um, back in episode 327, we talked about the employee exodus at Coinbase when Armstrong banned politics and activism at the company. Uh, he said, you know, we're here to work and we, we're not gonna talk about anything but work. So now Coinbase's Jason Fried takes that policy a step further and a third of the staff, including some who'd been there for 15 years, took buyouts and quit. So in a blog post on Monday, uh, Fried said employees would no longer be allowed to openly share their, quote, societal and political discussions, close quote, at work. He also said, which is so weird, no more paternalistic benefits. For years, we've offered a fitness benefit, a wellness allowance, a farmer's market share, and continuing education allowances. They felt good at the time, but we're, we've had a change of heart. It's none of our business what you do outside of work, and it's not base camp's place to encourage certain behaviors, regardless of good intentions. Woo. Who would want to work there with a guy like that? Well, I don't know. I mean, um, I have a certain sympathy for uh, for um, politics discussions in the workplace. Um, I can understand why people why business owners would not want that. It's I can understand that as well. Pretty, However, the the benefits, the other benefits, the wellness benefits and so on, what the hell? Well, that sounds like a political statement itself, just the, you know, that part of it. Um, I have, uh, I have the, this, this is a something I've been on about and BL, you and I have kind of disagreed with it, but I think I'm being about to be vindicated here. Uh, Apple's uh, benevolence, um, Apple fighting for your privacy, always, always looking out for you and your privacy. So this is from a Business Insider article by uh, Laura O'Reilly, and I'll just read the headline and the rest will speak for itself. As Apple tightens the screws on ad tracking, it's preparing a new ad format of its own. <laughs> People briefed on plans to reveal pricing models and targeting options. So that's what it was about all along. 
That's hilarious. Um, <laughs> does that bring us to smiles? It we need does. one. Yep. Okay, so I, I'm not exactly sure why Gary Larson trended on Twitter this week, but someone asked, what's your favorite Gary Larson cartoon? I think it was the 25th anniversary of one of his cartoons. So my favorite is there's a group of cows in a field. They're standing on their hind legs. They're having a conversation. There's one cow who, who yells out car and they all go in the, and the next panel is they're all uh, chewing their cuds in the field. <laughs> the car goes by and then they go back to standing and, and talking. And my other favorite is the real reason why dinosaurs uh, uh, died and they're, they're, all the dinosaurs are smoking cigarettes. So do you have a favorite? I have two favorites since you have two favorites. I get yeah. two favorites right now. <laughs> uh, my first one is uh, it's a it's a family of four uh, watching, watching. They're all watching know together uh they're on the couch there's the kids are on the on the floor with their head propped up on their uh up up on their head on their hands and um and they're all staring at a blank wall and the caption is the days before tv <laughs> what's your other one my other one is uh is um is a, a view from Mars where there's a bunch of Martians on the surface. I love all, this one. And they're all looking at Earth and there's these uh, mushroom clouds going up all over the place and all the Martians are going, ooh, ah. <laughs> <laughs> My other favorite one is um, the guy's on the phone with somebody and he says, uh, a house never for you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But anyway, um, <laughs> I, I will put the cow one in the show notes. That one just cry. There's so many. They're just yeah, so they funny. Are. And people posted them. And, you know, it's like there goes an hour. <laughs> golden days from the golden days of co of comic strips. Yeah, really. Yeah. That and um, Calvin and, and Hobbes. And Calvin and Hobbes. Kathy. Kathy said my favorite all time Kathy one was I loved my hair once in 1985 for 15 minutes. <laughs> All right, let's get on to uh, cool stuff. What do you got? Okay, so um, there's a an, uh, free online screen recorder called Recordcast, and you can record your screen and edit the video on this app, but it only works on Chrome, which is a problem for me because I don't like Chrome, but um, it's worth taking a look at. And uh, so it's called Recordcast. All right, so since you don't like Chrome, I'm going to tell you about Chrome DevTools. Yeah. <laughs> This is a, this is um, there's a, a link we'll put in the show notes for people to learn about Chrome Dev Tools, but baked into the into the browser are developer tools for web developers that you can if you right click on uh, on an element on a web page like a headline or something there's an you can option, see the code there's an option that says inspect and you can go right to that code and see the code and it has a bunch of other things like if your website is loading slowly then it tells you what resources are making it uh, load slowly it's a ton of stuff and then this link will teach you a lot about it so we'll include that in the show notes. i actually knew that aren't you surprised i kind of am <laughs> So we, we told you about this last year. Twitter has a 2021 marketing calendar. Uh, it's global with dates of significant events. And they say, you know, use this to discover opportunities to connect with your audience year round with relevant events and occasions and trends. And uh, so I'll put a note to it, a link to it in the show notes because it is helpful. Very cool. And do you have another? I do. This is another Google. Uh, this is Think with Google. Uh, find my audience tool. Uh, this is obviously this is obviously one of Google's tools to get you to buy advertising, but it's very cool nonetheless. Um, so it starts out with you have a choice of uh, do you want to find an in market somebody who's in the market to buy something audience, or do you want to find affinity audiences audiences who have affinity to a certain topic or or uh, um, yeah content. Um, so you choose one of the two and then then you uh, you offer the category that you um, that your business um, relates to. So I chose uh, affinity audiences and then I chose news and politics for our podcast. And then it gives you the top YouTube channels that your audience uh, is likely uh, watching. Uh, research and planning of uh, per researching or planning products, purchase products, the audiences they're likely to be a part of, and then subcategories with that. And then you can just kind of pipe 
plug all those audiences, that refined audience, into your advertising campaign on YouTube or, or Google, presumably. But it's a YouTube. Looks like it's a YouTube specific tool. But we'll put a link to it in the show notes. That is very interesting. So also from Google, uh, this is from the creator's blog and uh, the headline on it is writer's block, question mark. Um, so they have eight creators who are sharing tips and inspirations. And, uh, you know, the post starts out everybody's creative well runs dry sometimes. And so Google spoke with eight creators about their habits, their tools, and the inspirations that help them uh, spark fresh content ideas. And uh, it's an interesting bunch of interviews. Cool, cool, cool. I got a project. Me too. Uh, quickly, this is a blog post for my, my first blog post from a new employer to uh, How to go beyond integrated digital marketing. It's a long post. Uh, what is di integrated digital marketing? The nine essential elements of integrated digital marketing. And then I go on to talk about uh, how you can integrate three ways to integrate digital marketing into traditional marketing communication. So we'll link to that to that in the show notes for people who are interested. I'm interested. That sounds really great. So I am um, excited to be judging a Project Echo business plan competition for high school students. Oh. And it's kind of like Shark Tank for high school kids. And uh, they get uh, startup funds. The ones who win get startup funds that can be applied toward college. and. Uh, the top three teams in each competition category will each get money. And uh, you'll be able to watch the whole presentation by the kids who's, who are uh, contending, you know, the ones who are weeded out to be contending for the top prizes. And you'll be able to watch it on Sunday, May 16th on Facebook. And I'll put a link in the show notes. So this year, their categories are product services and social enterprise. And they want to not only crown the winners, but also help build a generation of entrepreneurs and community leaders who who will take risks. And, and believe me, presenting to a bunch of people on Facebook live is a risk for a kid. And on competition day, uh, they present to a panel of judges, which I'll be one of, and we will collectively evaluate the quality of the written business plans. We have a whole bunch of criteria and along with their presentation. So apparently what has happened in the past is some people have had uh, great plans and lousy presentations or great presentations and lousy plans. And so we each have to evaluate uh, three plans in advance of that, that day and give them feedback. Uh, so it's really um, fascinating. That's cool. And yeah. And it's kind of like shark tank for That's kids, fun. you know, That's fun. That's cool. <laughs> so, um, one of the things, I mean, we're all looking forward to, uh, you know, getting our, our vaccinations. First or second, my second one is is Tuesday, so I will be fully vaccinated on Tuesday and looking forward to getting out and doing the things that we missed as we're holed up in our, in our abodes during the pandemic. I can't wait to go see live music, sports and stuff. I've got tickets for the Twins on May 30th, so uh, that'll be awesome. Um, but um, another thing I'm, I'm really excited about doing is exercising. And I've got some data to back up. I'm not the only one. Uh, this, <laughs> is from, this is from the American Psychological Association. And 42% uh, of Americans gained weight while stuck at home during the pandemic. Not wow. surprising there. On average, people gained 29 pounds. You are kidding. Not. And uh, millennials, of which neither of us are, thankfully, in this, in this case, um, millennials had an average weight gain of 41 pounds. You are kidding. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Uh. That's horrific. Well, you know, I, my friends and I talk about this all the time. There is no way I would have gotten through this year were it not for my dog. Because right. every morning yeah. we do 8,000 steps before breakfast. Yeah. We, we go to Central Park and that's a mile away. And, you know, our round trip is, is almost three miles. And it has certainly kept me sane. I, I would have lost my mind altogether. I have friends and neighbors who don't leave the house. But, you know, when you do go to sports events, please wear your mask. Of course. Yeah. 
But, um, you know, I, I mean, it remains to be seen how this is all going to work out. I am vaccinated. I was therefore able to see my family for the first time in a year and hug everybody and have dinner together. And oh, it's so joyful. And, and like I told you, I had pizza the other day right. <laughs> in a restaurant. <laughs> So um, that brings us to the end of episode 348 of the Beyond Social Media Show. And um, we, we um, thank you for watching. And you can just find us by searching Beyond Social Media Show on Google. And uh, links to everything that we discussed today will be at beyondsocialmediashow.com slash 348. And I'm here with David Erickson. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, David's on Twitter as D Erickson, on Instagram as D E Erickson, on um, uh, YouTube as E Strategy. He blogs at e strategyblog.com. What is your handle on, on Clubhouse? D e. Erickson, I think, or D E Erickson. Yeah, I okay. I can't remember. I can't either. I should, um, should know that, I suppose, right? Yeah, I think I'm what's next, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I'll have to look. <laughs> um, so I'm on Twitter as what's next. My blog is what's next blog. I'm on YouTube is what's next blog. I have a website at blockman.com. And uh, you can listen to the show everywhere that you get podcasts. We are on all of those platforms. And uh, we will be back next week with David's interview. And we are thanking you for being here this week. Thanks for watching. <laughs>